Why is it that when you read a great story in a book, you're just as excited to go see that same narrative in a movie? I remember reading Jurassic Park. I loved that book, and I loved seeing it in the movie, as a movie. And I'm not the only one. Millions of people knew what was going to happen, and they still went to the theater. And we did this for the Lord of the Rings series. We did it for the Harry Potter series. All of the comic book movies that come out, they're based on a narrative you could already read. Over the course of my professional career, I've gotten to work with a lot of great storytellers. And what I find interesting is that with each story you tell, you don't necessarily need a new narrative. You just need to tell a story in a new way. And it's because as audience members, we all experience story differently, where we'll find meaning and where we won't. And so someone who relates to a love story told as a movie may get something completely different out of it as a book. So you don't necessarily need a new narrative. You just need to tell a story in a new way, and you do it well. And with each telling, there's a chance the audience will find new meaning. And that's, at its core, why we tell stories. And so we can share our ideas and our perspectives, our passion, so that maybe the audience can take something with them. Let me tell you my favorite story. If I were to tell you a story of a young man, a dreamer who's growing up on the outskirts of civilization, in the boonies, and because of an unexpected event, he gets spurred on an adventure to find he was destined for something greater. It's a pretty generic story, and one you've seen, heard, and read many times before. But what if that story was told using technology that made it feel new? That was Star Wars. Star Wars was a story you had heard before. It was a narrative we all knew, but it, when it was told with technology that was magical, it became this memorable and inspiring experience that has shaped generations, including mine. Now, this is a story from sixth grade, and it says something about me that in my sixth grade glamour shots, I had my first computer. <laughs> so from a young age, I loved technology. And I loved great stories like Star Wars and Jurassic Park and my favorite was Back to the Future. And so what I'm interested in is finding new ways of telling stories through new technology. When I graduated college with a degree in computer science, I was fortunate enough to work at Pixar. And over the course of 10 years, I got to work with these amazing artists and engineers, working on these beautiful films and working at one of the best companies you could work for. But my favorite story comes before my time there, back before anyone knew what Pixar was. And it was when a small handful of artists and engineers were working on this 90-second short about a lamp and its ball. That short was called Luxo Jr. And when it premiered for the first time in front of an audience in 1985, within 30 seconds, the audience was already standing on their feet and going nuts. It was a 90-second story. It's a story about a parent watching a curious kid at play. And it's a story we've seen before. But when this story was told with these believable computer-animated lamps that were jumping and acting and emoting, it made history and would change the entire film industry. When I worked at Pixar, I got to work on these amazing projects, these timeless, widely loved films. But they were fundamentally based on narratives you had heard before, like the story of a hotshot from the city who finds his heart in the country, or the story of a lovable nerd who just wants the hot new girl to like him, and finally, the story of an old man with the help of some friends finally completing his bucket list. And what made these stories great was that they weren't necessarily new narratives, but they were told in these fantastic settings 
with appealing characters and using dazzling technology. About three years ago, I was looking for our generation's leap forward, a new technology that would revolutionize the way we tell stories. And on March 18th, 2014, I found what I was looking for. That was the day that the second developer kit for the Oculus Rift came out to the public. And within the first 10 seconds of trying it, I was convinced. It blew my mind, and this was something that was going to change my life. I had tried virtual reality back in the early 90s when you had to go to an arcade and you wore this big device and you were sick within five minutes. <laughs> this version was so much better. It was lighter. It tracked you in a smooth way, and you could bring it home. And it had an amazing feature that convinced me this was the future. You could now move around as well as look around in a virtual space. And if you haven't tried virtual reality, immersive virtual reality that you can move around in, if you haven't experienced immersive virtual reality, it's an experience that's too hard to describe. But for those of you who haven't tried it, when you do, you still know you have this device on your face, and you still know you're looking into a screen. But it's uncanny how a large part of your mind, all the way down to the lizard part, is convinced that you're in this reality that doesn't actually exist. And it works because as you move around in the virtual world, sorry, in the real world, the virtual world presented to you moves and sounds in the same way you've always gotten feedback through your eyes and ears. And the best way to create these virtual worlds is by using computer game technology. But the cool thing about VR is that the way you interact with these gaming systems is the same way you've always interacted with the real world. Everyone knows how to move and look around. And so here was our idea. What if we use computer game technology I was fortunate enough to join Oculus and create a small group of artists and engineers dedicated to making immersive virtual reality. We called ourselves Oculus Story Studio. And our mission was to figure out this, this new medium, to figure out the language and the tools. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Our first experience was called Lost, and it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2015. It's about a mysterious creature you meet in this moonlit forest, and you soon find out he's just this lost puppy looking for something. And at the end, you meet his master, who's this 60-foot-tall robot. He crashes through the forest, looms over you, and then you find out he's just looking for his missing hand. Lost is a story that takes about five minutes. I can describe it to you in a few sentences, and it's deeply inspired by one of my favorite childhood films, the 1999 classic, The Iron Giant. Yeah, I love that film. But when we started showing it to the audience, they were saying they'd never seen anything like this before. This feeling of this huge robot towering over them was a feeling they'd never had before. And we call that feeling presence. And this is the magic of VR. This is that thing I was talking about that you feel in your lizard brain. And when you get it right, this is the defining characteristic of virtual reality. For our second project, we wanted to make the audience laugh. And even more importantly, we wanted to introduce them to an animated character that they feel present with. And the result of that was Henry. A 13-minute short that premiered in late 2015 in Hollywood. And Henry is the story of this cute hedgehog who just wants another animal friend to hug him on his birthday. But he's got a spiky body. And so when he makes his birthday wish, it has some unintended and what we were hoping would be laugh-out-loud moments. It didn't work out that way. We were starting to play around with the fact that we knew where you were in this virtual world, and so we started tailoring moments like that one. We found the most successful way to have Henry connect with you 
was have him glance at the audience to share moments of happiness, sadness, and surprise. When he just looked at the screen, you need to keep in mind he's not looking at a camera. He's looking at you, the audience member that feels present in his home and who could be standing or sitting or even leaning forward. He's a character acting in real time so he can change how his neck turns and where his eyes are looking. And you feel like he sees you, an animated character. We feel like we found a new technique, a new word in our language that we call look at. And similar to how you would use a close-up in film, it's a way we can create connection between the audience and the characters. A lot of the humor in Henry comes from moments like this. Oops. Yeah, we thought it was pretty funny. But actually, what started happening was because of these look-at moments, the silly moments got overshadowed by this new feeling our audience had for, for this cute character that was standing in front of them and just wanted another animal friend to hug. And so the audience felt like they were in the space of his sadness, and they were in that moment of joy when his wish does finally come true. So as a result, we didn't get as many laughs as we wanted, but we did get more tears than we were expecting. For a third project, we wanted to show that this was a medium that had range, and we could explore a lot of different topics and feelings. And we wanted to try to tell a story dealing with loss, grief, and how you deal with it. So our, for our third project, we wanted to tell the story of a young girl who's dealing with a profound loss in her life, and it, who is a budding artist herself. And our director wanted to put you inside of her imagination as she was dealing with this. And he felt like the best way to do that was to have her imagination draw in around you. We just finished Dear Angelica, and it's going to premiere at the Sundance Film Festival this coming January. And I'm really proud of this project and what my team did, because it's unlike anything you can experience in any other medium. When we started working on Dear Angelica, we had this brilliant artist, Wesley Alsbrook, and she was doing these amazing 2D illustrations. And we tried to take them and bring them into a virtual space. And it didn't feel right. It felt flat because she was working in a flat format, and we were trying to make it work in a 3D space. And then we had a breakthrough. When Inigo Quiles, our resident mad scientist, made a tool taking advantage of new technology where we can track your hands just as accurately as we can track your head. And with this tool, Wesley can now draw in 3D space all around her. And we can record the order and the timing of those strokes and use that to orchestrate a story that draws in around you. To feel present inside these drawings, that draw in around you, and these things have depth. You can actually look around them and even put your head inside of them. It's really amazing. So you're now all caught up to present day. And throughout this talk, I've been using the word audience. And right now, I don't think that word works anymore. An audience implies that you simply observe and listen. And in a VR story, you participate. Participant that doesn't feel right. That feels too sterile, like you're in a lab experiment. We didn't like user, because a user, that doesn't feel right. You don't use a story. And a, a player, that's what you use for games and puzzles. My favorite word is visitor. And I really like this word because it captures how you feel like you're invited into the story. And it implies how the storyteller needs to be mindful of how they host you in the worlds they create, and how they introduce you to the characters in whose stories you're entering. These are the early days of this medium. We're still figuring out how to use presence. We're still figuring out the techniques and the words like look at. And we're finding that the audience is actually a visitor. We're even having to build new tools like Quill. 
But it's undeniable that this feeling of being transported to a different place in the comfort of your living room is magical, despite the fact that we're still figuring things out. This is what early film audiences saw. This was a blockbuster in the early 1900s. To go to your local theater and see a vaudeville act, something you could have seen in real life. But it was this technical marvel of projected light to go to a theater and, and see some spectacle from around the world. It was awesome. When my mother saw Lost for the first time, she's actually in the audience, it was also the first time she saw virtual reality. So I have to admit, she was a bit overwhelmed. I'll use overwhelmed. <laughs> Within the first 30 seconds, she actually began covering her eyes, trying to cover her eyes, right? She has a headset on and looking away. <laughs> and it was just hard for her to, to, to realize that she was just in her living room, and then she was in this forest at the same time. But after she got that out of her system and got the novelty shock off, she knew what was going to happen. And she found awe and wonder the second time. It took decades of those vaudeville acts, of seeing the directors tinkering and experimenting until the audience was shown a coherent feature-length film that resembled the movies we watch today. But until that time happened, the audience still showed up for the experiments. That's where we're at now with VR. We need the time to develop the language and the tools so we can show you a coherent feature-length story in VR. But until that time happens, the experience is so new. The novelty is enough. What really excites me about VR, and why I hope to be working on this for the rest of my career, is we have decades of tinkering and experimenting ahead of us. But what we can do now, the way we can host people in places they could not experience in any other medium, or even in reality itself, is really exciting. It means I can put you in stories where you feel present in your favorite childhood movies, or where you feel present inside a story where you meet an animated character for the very first time. Or I can put you in a story where you feel present inside someone's imagination as it draws in around you. This is why I've fallen in love with VR. And it's not because it's a medium that will unlock new types of narrative. It's because this is a medium where I can give the visitor an experience they've never had before. And this is why I love doing it. I love giving something new to an audience. And I can't wait until you all experience what it's like to visit a story.